Hi, my name is Kashmir Hill. I'm a journalist and I write about the way that technology is changing our lives for the good and for the bad. Because it's both, right? Technology is improving our lives in ways that a lot of the speakers have talked about here. It's giving us new powers, it's making us superhuman, but at the same time, it's make, uh, making us vulnerable in new ways because of the way that it can be used to track and control us. This is what I'm obsessed with as a journalist, and I'm always exploring that tension. And one of the ways I love to do this is in the first person, where I try to an anticipate a future tech dystopia and live in it, which is how I decide to do this story. Um, cameras are getting smaller, sensors are getting smaller, we're putting them in more and more devices. And I wanted to find out, as the Internet of Things gets more pervasive, how it's going to affect our privacy. So I, worked, so I turned my one-bedroom apartment in San Francisco into a smart home. I bought a whole bunch of Internet-connected objects, ridiculous things, like a smart toothbrush, a smart bed, a smart baby monitor. Um, yeah, th I, basically anything you build, somebody makes it smart. And I worked with a technologist named Surya Matu, who created a router that kept track of all of the information that was leaving our house and all of the information that was coming in. Um, and I've got a little video about what it was like living in the house. Companies are offering us all kinds of internet connected devices. Being smart means a device can connect to the internet, it can gather data, and it can talk to its owner. But once your appliances can talk to you, who else are they going to be talking to? I turned my one-bedroom apartment in San Francisco into a smart home. Basically, the goal of the experiment was to find out how much it would be monitoring my family and myself. I already had an Amazon Echo, the smart speaker, we had a Vizio smart TV, but I bought a bunch of other devices. I built a special router that let me look at all the network activity. We were seeing what her ISP could see, but more importantly, what they could sell. We ran the experiment for two months. In that two months, there wasn't a single hour of digital silence in the house. One thing we discovered is that the devices, all, almost all the devices, talk to the companies that made them. The TV was sending a lot of information out about the Hulu shows we watched to data brokers, so people that like track people's behavior. One of the funny things about living in a smart home is how easy it was to forget that all of these devices were recording us and tracking our activity. These things don't look like cameras. Like the coffee maker doesn't look like it's recording us. So it was really easy to forget that it was happening. What was significant to me about this is that it, it, it was allowing tracking to move off of computers and off of screens and actually into my home. And just getting this really like basic, boring information, but revealing information about how we live our lives. I guess it just bothers me that it's like tracking moving into our physical lives instead of just in a place that we can kind of at least control because we're on a screen. We've long been told that if it's free, you're the product. But with the Internet of Things, it seems, even if you pay, you're still the product. So you really have to ask, who is the true beneficiary of your smart home? You are the company mining you. So my takeaway from this experiment is that the privacy trade-offs weren't worth it. It wasn't captured in the video, but um, living in the smart home was terrible. Like, none of the devices worked well. Um, every morning when we woke up, uh, we had connected our smart coffee pot to the Amazon Echo. And so we'd wake up in the morning and we'd be trying to tell Alexa to make us coffee. But you had to use like a particular phrase to do it. You, t you had to say, um, Alexa, ask the Be More to run Quick Start. And every morning, my husband and I couldn't remember this phrase, and so we'd wake up and we'd just be like yelling at the smart speaker every morning, and eventually my husband would just get up and he'd say, okay, I'm just gonna go to the kitchen to press the button on the coffee maker to make it run. And I'd be like, no, we have to do it the smart way. And uh, it was horrible. So after I was done with that experiment, I wanted to get as far away from technology as possible. And so I was trying to think about an experiment I could do that would involve avoiding surveillance instead of embracing it. And um, I, you know, I write a lot about the big American technology companies, Google and Amazon and Facebook and Microsoft and Apple. And I often write about these companies in a very critical way. And the response when you criticize these companies is 
you know, if, if you don't like them, then just don't use their products. We're, you're not being forced to. So just avoid them if you don't like them. And I wondered if that were, was actually possible. Could you avoid the tech giants? Uh, so that's why I decided to do this story. Um, and I thought this was a really, like, you know, clever idea. Uh, <laughs> but I quickly discovered that many journalists have tried this. You know, hate Amazon, try living without it. I tried leaving Facebook, I couldn't. You know, this guy tried to quit Google. Uh, but when these people tried to avoid the tech giants, they would just, you know, not log in. You know, stop using their Gmail for a week, um, delete their Facebook account, you know, don't order things from Amazon. But because I'm a technology journalist, I know that we interact with these companies in invisible ways all the time, and that we rely on them in ways um, that we, we, we can't see. And so I wanted to really, really avoid them. Um, so I went to a technologist, Drew Marotra, and I said, hey, I want to block these companies from my life. I don't want them to get my data, my time, my money, my attention. How can I just completely cut them out? And he went and did some research, and he came back to me and said, I, I have a way we can do it. All of the tech companies publish lists of the IP addresses that they control. So I'll create a tool for you, a virtual private network or a VPN, and you can connect all of your devices to it, and um, I will just block the IP addresses controlled by the particular tech giant that you're trying to, trying to avoid. And as you can see, Amazon and Microsoft, uh, they're both web hosting companies, so they have a lot of IP addresses, and Facebook is, is kind of the laggard. So we tried this, and it worked. Uh, and so over the course of six weeks, I blocked Amazon, I blocked Facebook, I blocked Google, I blocked Microsoft, blocked Apple, and then I blocked them all at the end. And for a lot of people in the audience um, who live in Kosovo, you might be thinking, this is our life. Like, we can't, <laughs> there are many of these services that we can't use. Um, uh, but for me, in the United States, this was very novel. Uh, the, first, the first week I decided to block Amazon because we were very reliant on Amazon. You know, as you saw in the video, we had an Amazon Echo, the smart speaker. It's the only thing we use to play music in the house. Uh, we both had Amazon Prime credit cards. We shopped at Whole Foods. And I thought, okay, well, this is gonna be, this is gonna be tough on us. Um, but it was far harder than I could have imagined because everybody thinks of Amazon as a retailer. Uh, but it's actually far more profitable from its web hosting. And so when I was blocking Amazon, I discovered that a third of the internet stopped working for me. Many apps on my phone stopped working. Um, it was just, uh, you know, impossible to avoid Amazon, both in the real world and in the digital world. Um, in the real world, I started using other sites to buy things. I bought things uh, locally, though that was challenging in its own ways because like our grocery store didn't have diapers and my daughter's size, because they just don't stock them anymore because no one buys diapers in stores, they all order them online. And I had to order um, a little phone holder for my car and I ordered on eBay.com. Is eBay, does eBay work in Kosovo? Yes. Okay. So I was like, okay, great, I'll just order it from eBay. I order it, two days later, I go to our mailbox and I've got an Amazon envelope in my mailbox. I'm like, what the hell? and open it up, it's the phone holder inside, and the eBay seller was uh, using an Amazon service, Fulfillment by Amazon, so he stores his product in the Amazon warehouse, and Amazon sends it out for him. Um, and the same thing happened in uh, the digital world. Uh, the whole week I was using the website Gizmodo that I was writing this story for, and it was working fine, so I thought everything was fine, I talked to our tech team and said, who hosts us? And they said, oh, we use AWS. Um, and discovered that uh, a lot of websites, you know, they have, a, they have a web host like Amazon or Google or Microsoft, but then they often use a content delivery network on top of that so that they can load their website faster. It's, it's better for kind of delivering information locally. So we used a CDN, and so my blocking tool would sometimes see the CDN, and then we weren't blocking things from Amazon. But um, yeah, Amazon was very hard. I found that many competitors are reliant on Amazon services, including all of the entertainment sites. So we couldn't watch Netflix, we couldn't watch HBO Go, and my daughter was particularly tortured by this because she couldn't watch any of the movies she liked. When I blocked Facebook, Facebook was technically easier to block. Um, you know, I stopped using Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp, and um, it, it, 
Facebook isn't as woven into the infrastructure of the internet as some of the other companies that I blocked. Um, they, there were a lot of trackers. Uh, Facebook has something called Facebook Pixel that sits on a lot of product pages. And it's why when you're on a, when you're on a website and you're looking at a dress, and then later you go onto Facebook or Instagram and you get uh, an ad for that dress, it's because Facebook has trackers everywhere. It sees that you were on that, um, on that vendor's page. So it wasn't hard to block Facebook. Um, the, the difficult thing is I just realized how dominant Facebook is in the social media industry. Um, I lost the ability to find out what was happening with my friends. The big thing that happened this week is my very good friend who lived across the, the country, her name's Chico, she had a baby. And I didn't discover until a couple of weeks later when I went back onto Facebook. And I called her and I said, congratulations, I'm so happy for you. Um, I, I'm sorry I'm late congratulating you, but I didn't know that you had your baby. Um, and she said, oh, well, I just assume if I put something on Facebook, everybody sees it. And um, it, it's true. I mean, Facebook has this control of the infrastructure and in social media such that it's, it's hard to leave. And by leaving, you're leaving behind everyone else who is there. And you can go to a different social network site. You can go to Mastodon, which is a nice like, open source, decentralized um, social network, except you'll be the only one there. Your friends won't be there. Oops. So Google, Google was difficult in the same way that Amazon was difficult um, in that it's really woven into the infrastructure of the internet. And when I was blocking Google, it felt like I had been, um, uh, I'd been sent back to the internet in the 1990s because every single website that I tried to load would just spin and spin forever and it would take like a minute for the content to load. And that's because almost every website that I visited, they had Google assets. So they have Google ads, Google trackers, Google analytics, Google font. Where Google fonts were everywhere. Everybody relies on this, um, this font library so that they can load websites faster. Uh, and it had the opposite effect for me this month. And I discovered that most websites are loading content from Google before they load their own content. Um, so it was just very hard to access the web. I also ran into a problem of every time I went to a website or an app that had any kind of mapping function, it would often be broken or not work at all because Google is so dominant in the maps industry. Um, something like 90% of mapping applications online and in apps are provided by Google. So um, applications like Lyft and Uber, transportation apps that you can't use here, I couldn't use them either because you couldn't type in the destination without accessing Google Maps. Microsoft, Microsoft was pretty easy. <laughs> um, I, don't, I, I didn't interact a lot with Microsoft online. I do use some Microsoft products like LinkedIn um, uh, and Skype a lot in my work, but I could avoid them for, for a week. The harder thing is that um, my blocker couldn't block Microsoft because most of my interactions with it were in the real world. Um, you know, in, I was, you know, when I was on the train in San Francisco, I realized that uh, it was powered by Microsoft's Windows servers, and it would happen in coffee shops. I'd realize they were using Windows. Um, and Microsoft just isn't, um, um, it's more of a business to business company and not a business to consumer company. The one place I discovered it was actually in our car. We had a Ford Fusion, and I got inside. We've been driving the car for months, and I'd never noticed there was a placard that said Sync powered by Microsoft. So Microsoft had designed um, and provided the technology for the entertainment and navigation system in the car. So I just had to drive in silence. Apple, um, the hardest thing about Apple was that I was very dependent on Apple products. I realized I was kind of a Mac head. I had a MacBook at work, a MacBook at home. I have an iPhone. Uh, it was my gateway to all things digital. So I just had to completely change the hardware that I use. Um, and so I got a Linux computer from a company called Purism, whose goal is to kind of release people from data slavery and let people own their own data. And, and that wasn't that hard. It was just like learning to drive a new car. Um, the harder thing was the phone, and I'm gonna talk about that later. Uh, while I was blocking all the tech giants, we wanted to capture how often they tried to interact with me. And so this is the number of times that they tried to ping my devices. 
while I was blocking them. And as you can see, Amazon and Google were just the huge outliers. Like you cannot avoid these two companies. Even when they're not using their products, even when you're actively trying to block them, you will interact with them hundreds of thousands of times. So my big takeaways are were that Amazon, you know, just realizing what a behemoth it was, and they control half of online commerce in the United States. Uh, but AWS is kind of the scarier part of Amazon, um, in that it is just uh, become such a dominant web hosting platform just in the last decade, and it's one of those ways in which Amazon just moves into new industries all the time and just takes them over. Um, on Facebook. Just realizing they have very few, if any, serious competitors in the social network site, I think it explains a lot about their privacy invasions over the years that they can abuse us. It feels like an abusive relationship that we have as users of Facebook. They keep doing these horrible things, but we keep using them because there's not another option. Um, Google as a mapping behemoth, not being able to use certain apps, uh, really woven into the fabric of the web. Uh, when I try to use Dropbox, uh, to host uh, some content, I discovered I couldn't sign in to Dropbox because they use a, in a kind of an invisible recapture program uh, from Google that tells them whether or not a visitor is human or a bot. And because I was blocking Google, uh, Dropbox thought I wasn't human. Um, Microsoft, it was interesting because it made me look back at the antitrust case in. Uh, that happened in the US in the late 90s, where Microsoft used to be like this big technology company that was scary big. Um, people, you know, uh, thought it was the evil was gonna take over the world. It was killing its competitors. And so um, the American government decided to, they were thinking about breaking up the company and they went after it. It were years of litigation. Nothing actually happened, but a lot of scholars feel that it scared Microsoft and that it stopped them from trying to kill off competition and it allowed companies like Google, Facebook, and Amazon to rise up and become the behemoths they are today. So for me, the Microsoft Week really raised this question about what government should do about those behemoths today to make sure that we leave space for new companies to develop. And then Apple, I just realized how annoying Apple is. Um, I mean, I'm just showing the dongles here. I mean, once you get captured by Apple's gated community, um, you just think that like that's normal, and you don't realize how in how um, how interoperable other systems are. Um, and so, like when I was trying to get my contacts off of Apple, so I could call people from a different phone, it was so hard. I had to. Um, I had to export my contacts, upload, to them the, the, upload them to the cloud, download them, put them on a new phone. And then when I started using um, other products, I realized, oh, you can just use Bluetooth connection, just send your contacts to another device. And I just didn't realize how much Apple captures you in their environment. So in my last week, I blocked all of the tech giants. And this was the, this was the technology I had to use. Like I went back to books instead of using my Amazon Kindle. I just used a... a, a an analog calendar. Um, I had an old digital camera from, uh, from my college days. And I used this phone because when I went to get a smartphone, I realized that Apple and Google have a duopoly on smartphones. Um, it was, at, at the point I did my experiment, there were no commercially available phones that didn't have Apple or Google technology because Google owns Android. So I went back to using a Nokia 3310. Uh, dumb phone, then it just uh, it just basically texted and called. Did anybody have the Nokia 3310 back in the day? Yeah, I'm happy to report it still has the game Snake on it. Uh, and uh, it was hard. It's hard living in the world without a smartphone, but um, there were there were benefits to it in that when I closed my computer, I was done with the internet. I had a real separation between my day-to-day -day world and, um, and kind of my digital self. And so these are just some of the alternatives I used um, during that week and companies I, I talked to that are, that are you know, trying to operate in a world, trying to create products that don't use, that don't use the tech giants. Um, they're out there, but they're, they're nascent and it's hard to compete with these companies because they're just so big. Um, this was in the last week, this is how often even when I was trying to block all of the companies and when I wasn't using a smartphone, this was still how often um, the companies kind of tried to interact with mostly my computer. And as you can see, 
Google and Amazon are just really hard to avoid. And my bigger takeaway from this experiment was that the technology, these American technology companies are so woven into the infrastructure of the internet that to get away from them was to get away from technology entirely. So it made me just reassess my relationship with technology. And um, especially with my smartphone, and I realized how addicted to my smartphone I'd gotten. And this was kind of a digital detox where I realized I hated that I started every day by, before I talk to my husband, before I play with my two-year-old, I pick up my phone and I just start scrolling and looking at email, looking at text message, messages, looking at the internet, um, just immediately plugging my brain into this thing rather than being where I was, being with the people around me. And so the, the, the major way I've changed my behavior since I did this experiment is I just turn off my smartphone every night uh, around 8 or 9 p.m. and then I don't turn it on the next day until I'm really ready to start working. And that's been very powerful for me. Uh, and it means that this doesn't control me 24 hours a day. Um, so anyways, if you guys have any questions about any of this, um, if you want to send me any story ideas, um, tech problems you have, uh, ideas for first-person adventures, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and thanks so much for coming to hear me talk. Thank <laughs> you.